my email real quick and make sure that he didn't. Uh, let's see how I. Want a little, uh, little privacy. There it is. Okay. Give it a second. There we go. Thanks. Yep. Now you're off the. Nope. Just award wallet <coughs> something. He is in town. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yep. There we go. Hey there. How are you? Great to see you. Thank you for coming back. Right? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, so I, I'm, I'm writing a book now about cases where the UN or some other external actor picks up authority or responsibility for functions that we would usually entrust only to the state. So uh, the <coughs> I was just reading about the special tribunal for Lebanon, or, or I'm also looking at things like policing in Haiti or uh, Central African Republic and uh, shared economic uh, signatory authority in Liberia, um, and, uh, and, and thinking, thinking a, a fair amount about there's some intersection between some of the uh, ideas that I know you've written about in terms of, of ideas about national identity, sort of ownership of, of, of political decision making on the part of local actors. And so mine is mainly just focused on sort of the state versus the uh, United Nations, but uh, a lot of things that you've worked on I'm interested in as well. Now, when you say that the United Nations has taken over some of the functions of the state in the state of Palestine, is that a function of being pushed by, by the IMF? Or it's the, the cases I'm looking at, I've drawn the boundary around, uh, around the study by looking at cases where there's some sort of formal government, government request and or consent to the but UN picking this up. Because someone needs some, oh, some other function. Well, it's rare in the economic arena despite the interest in getting debt relief or getting access to IMF. So that doesn't, that's important. That's important. That's important. That's important. It doesn't happen often in the economic arena. It's mostly when, uh, when either there's a security crisis and the, the government is afraid that things will simply implode if they don't have some kind of external intervening uh, uh, actor and the, the external actors aren't willing to send their troops to be subject to local command. And so the deal is that if we're going to be sending supplies for troops that Receive some sort of decision-making authority to our people in the field, and then the other case where it comes up a lot are on these uh, transitional justice mechanisms, in <coughs> part because the government wants to see of international legitimacy, so it seems a little bit less politicized, and also because yeah, the government wants to offload some of the political responsibility for, for the verdicts uh, as in, in the Lebanon case. But it's uh, it's been striking to me, and I've talked to a lot of interviewees about the question of, of sort of IMF World Bank. Access and uh, almost everybody has said the same thing about this, which is that governments tend to be most resistant to, uh, or incumbent officials, I should say, tend to be most resistant to ceding any kind of authority over purse strings and financial management. Uh, that they're ready to to delegate uh, governance authority in a whole host of other areas, but not when it comes to sort of making decisions about where the money goes. There you go. I mean, that's 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 the implicit. That's the implicit point that folks are making. Uh, and in fact, there are only a few cases uh, uh, where that's been done in the economic arena. But I'm having fun with it. I'm going to go to Lebanon next month and, and we'll try to maybe do some yeah, stuff. Yeah, 
Oh, well, this is sort of. So, Welcome, no. everybody. Uh, I'm John Chorciari. I'm the director of the International Policy Center here at the Ford School, and we are delighted to welcome back to Ford Scott Atron. Scott is the research director in anthropology at the National Center for Scientific Research in France, where he has a tenured appointment at the École Normale Supérieure. He's also a founding fellow of the Center for Resolution of Intractable Conflict at Oxford. Uh, he has, he's a research director of Artists International, as you see on the opening slide here. He's got appointments also at UM's Department of Psychology and the Institute for Social Research. And last but certainly not least, he was recently reappointed as an adjunct research professor uh, at the Ford School. Um, we've certainly benefited greatly over the years from engagement with Scott, in particular his work that he's done with Bob Axelrod, one recent example of which you can find in Science Magazine on challenges in researching terrorism in the field. Uh, Scott's a globally recognized expert uh, uh, on how scientists and ordinary people reason about nature, on the psychology of religion, and on the limits of rational choice explanations for political and cultural conflict. He really embodies the link between the academy and the policy arena uh, that we try to foster here at the Ford School and at IPC. Uh, Scott briefs officials in the U.S. and in European governments, in NATO, in the United Nations, and a number of other entities, nationally and internationally, on issues ranging from pathways to violent extremism uh, to conflict in the Middle East and beyond. Uh, he was, in fact, the first anthropologist I learned recently to address a full ministerial meeting of the UN Security Council a few years ago to shed light on the relationship between youth, peace, and security. Uh, that's just one of many examples. He contributes often to the New York Times and to Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, he's also been featured 
uh, in, in the New York Times Magazine, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Nature, and other prominent publications. Uh, his numerous scholarly books include, and I'll name just a few to give you a sense of the breadth of his work, Cognitive Foundations of Natural History Toward an Anthropology of Science by Cambridge University Press, In Gods We Trust, The Evolutionary Landscape of Religion by Oxford, The Native Mind and the Cultural Con Construction of Nature by MIT Press with Doug Nedin, and Talking to the Enemy, Violent Extremism, Sacred Values, and What It Means to be Human by Penguin Press. And that latter book is related, of course, to the topic of today's address. So rather than have me talk further about uh, the wealth of insights that Scott can bring to you, I'll allow him to do that for himself. So thank you for coming back to the Ford School, Scott. It's great to have you. Thanks, Don. Well, thank you very much. And I'm happy to be back at the Ford School after so long. I'm mostly based in Europe these days, but it's always nice to be back here in Ann Arbor, visit some old friends talk to some new ones. What I wanted to discuss today is um, research on the front lines uh, with the Islamic State uh, in Iraq, but to speak to a larger, larger question. Um, first raised by Obama in September 2014, the, the biggest mistake he said that the United States has made in the Middle East recently was to underestimate the willingness to fight of the Islamic State and to overestimate the willingness to fight of the Iraqi army. And that he and James Clapper, as National Intelligence Director, said is due to the fact that willingness to fight is an imponderable. So the purpose of this research was to try to find out whether indeed willingness to fight is ponderable or imponderable. <laughs> <laughs> and as you'll see, I think it's eminently ponderable. And we've come up with, I think, new ways and experiments to probe that. And it speaks to larger questions in um, political sociology and science and in psychology and in human history about what motivates civilizations, willingness to fight and die for them, and what accounts for their survival or their end. So the research question is a more general question. How comes it that humans make their greatest exertions, including killing and dying, not for their own gain, lives, or family, but for an idea, a transcendent moral conception they have of who I am and who we are. And this is the privilege of absurdity to which no creature but man is subject, said Hobbes in the Leviathan. So our multidisciplinary and multinational team of academics, policymakers, former military, playwrights and poets as well, explores why people refuse political compromise, go to war, attempt revolution, or resort terrorism, focusing on what Darwin called those virtues and values highly esteemed and even sacred that give immense advantage to any group inspired by devoted individuals willing to sacrifice for them. Here's an example of our, that handsome devil in the middle is me, of our recent uh, work on the front lines. This was the first battle uh, for the retaking of Mosul, the first sort of practice battle. It was a battle called Kudilla. It was a very interesting battle. There were five to 600 uh, Peshmerga, Kurdish Peshmerga forces, Iraqi army, Arab Sunni militia, arrayed against about 90 Islamic State fighters in this particular village. Uh, 52 of them died. There were a score of suicide bombers called Inghamasi. These are specially trained to pierce enemy lines. And in fact, the retreat of the last uh, 15 were covered by seven suicide bombers. So this is an example of commitment and it was such that when the, the purpose of this battle was to give the lands, the, the villages back to the Arab Sunni militia from the same tribes they had been taken from. And although the forces, overwhelming forces, were able eventually to kick out the Islamic State after what many describe as the fiercest battle in their lives, uh, when they left the Sunni militia, the task of taking, keeping hold of their villages, the Sunni militia asked, well, you're going to stay with us, of course. And they said, no, we can't. And although the Sunni militia outnumbered by two to one the Islamic State, they decided to withdraw the next day. And of course, ISIS came back in. This, I think, is a parable for the entire situation in the Middle East today. I, I view the Islamic State more as a symptom of some structural um, dynamics in the Islamic State that haven't changed a whit uh, since the, um, the attempt to displace them. 
And I see that although the Islamic State will probably be destroyed in Raqqa and Mosul and their territorial base destroyed, I think that something uh, as bad or worse will probably succeed them. Anyway, that's my opinion. We can talk about that later. So how do we proceed? We interview political and military leaders, fighters and militants, supporters and would-be volunteers to generate hypotheses. Then we do lab experiments, even with students, <laughs> uh, to test their plausibility. And then we do structured interviews and experiments with leaders, militants and supporters again, and then experimentally design mass surveys to test potential pathways to and from violence. So our studies of political and cultural conflicts su suggest that unconditional cooperation and intractable conflict are best understood within a devoted actor versus a rational actor framework, which merges two research paradigms, one on sacred values. Those are values, whether religious or secular, as when land or law become holy or hallowed, and identity fusion, which gives a sense, a visceral sense of oneness and invincibility uh, to any group in which an individual is fused. And here's how we test identity fusion. It's a very simple test. We test it out on 10-year-olds before we test it out on other people. We just give pairs of circles, and we can do this dynamically on the iPad or with paper and pencil. And we ask people to pick which best represents their relationship to the group. And those who pick the last one be think and behave differently from those who pick any other pair of circles. Uh, you look at the histograms, they're actually stunning. And this is no matter what culture or group we happen to be uh, working, group, working with. This is going by itself, right? Um, the Islamic State is really a classic revolution. I don't like the word terrorism. I don't think it tells us much about anything at all. Um, in the sense that the French Revolution was, or the German Nazi Revolution, or the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and I think that the criteria we found that describe the Islamic re State Revolution and its willingness to sacrifice is very similar to these other ones. Now, in terms of sacred values, much more is known about economic decision-making than morally motivated decision-making, value-driven decision-making especially. But here are some features of sacred values I think we should consider. Now, I have nothing like a prospect theory of sacred values. I wish I did. Just some empirical um, findings uh, of interest. First, they're um, immune to material trade-offs. Most of us, many at least in the world, wouldn't sacrifice um, their children or their country or their religion for all the money in China. Um, of course, in standard economic and political theory, most things are fungible. In fact, probably everything is fungible in some sense or another. But here we have an almost asymptotic uh, relationship to the values themselves. They're insensitive to temporal and space, spatial discounting. Again, in economic and political theory, those things that are close to you in space and time are usually more valuable than those things that are further away. But with things that are sacred, the opposite is often true. Those things in the distant past or the distant future may be much more valuable than things in the here and now. Think of the exodus from Egypt or the second coming, or even places like Gettysburg um, that imbue one with a sense of who I am and who we are. Uh, they, they blind people to exit strategies. No matter how reasonable or rewarding, um, people react to attempts to buy them off or to um, use material incentives or, sensitive, incentives or disincentives, carrots and sticks, um, as insults that only inspire increased anger, opposition to, to, to any kind of political compromise, uh, and violence. Uh, and they generate actions independent of prospects of success because they're the right thing to do, whatever the consequences, the risks, and rewards. And as we'll see, they have distinct brain signatures. <laughs> so we consider abortion rights or gun rights in America, consider Russia's relationship to the Crimea as opposed to the Ukraine, or China's relationship to, uh, to Taiwan, or the Palestinian right of return. We do surveys with the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research that show only between 6 and 8 percent of refugees, Palestinian refugees, would actually choose to go back to their homes in Israel, present-day Israel, if they had a chance. But well over 80 percent of Palestinians wouldn't reject the right of return. And in fact, the more we offer, or the more material incentives are offers to Palestinians to give up the right of return in exchange for a peace, for example, along the 1967 borders, the more they're inclined to support things like suicide, terrorism, and continued 
uh, struggle against Israel. And if you want, I can talk about the actual experiments uh, we did. The one, of the one we did with leaders in Science Magazine and the other with mass surveys of thousands of people, both in Israel and in Palestine, um, in the proceedings of the National Academy. Brain scans, this is very interesting. Why do we do brain scans? Well, sometimes you do brain scans because you discover fascinating and novel things. For instance, uh, one of our collaborators, Molly Crockett, uh, found that um, brain centers associated with revenge and joy are actually the same, and that has very intriguing implications uh, for understanding what's going on in terms of political conflict. And what we're, we were very interested in finding out in terms of our brain stands of, this, of supporters of uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate Lashkar Taiba in terms of willingness to fight and die for sacred values was that those areas of the brain associated with deliberative reasoning um, were inhibited in favor of rapid duty-bound responses. Um, so utilitarian reasoning wasn't much involved uh, at all. And why do you want to do brain scans? Well, my interest is, is not necessarily discovery, although if serendipitously we should discover something like Molly did, that would be fantastic. But it's rather to show that the behavioral results we have isn't simply the result of posturing. And I think that, 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 that that's enough. Also, the fact that this is the first time anybody's done anything with any radical group at all in terms of brain scanning is interesting. Now, we find that three critical factors are involved in willingness to fight and die and that have been uh, neglected in sort of standard views of what motivates fighting spirit. Now, in military uh, history, sociology, and psychology, fighting spirit, especially in the studies involving the Brits and the Americans since World War II, focus on camaraderie and, 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 and buddies, people sacrifice for their buddies. Um, there's nothing in terms of ideology, or very little in terms of ideology, except in terms of opportunity costs and, trans and transaction costs, ways to summarize um, effective strategies to make them more militarily effective, but nothing in terms of just the basic transcendental value of the cause itself. Um, and the spiritual dimension that I'm talking about, again, doesn't necessarily mean religious, it can just as much mean se secular, and it involves three critical factors. First, uh, willingness to um, commit to sacred values and the group's actors are fused with. The devoted actor, remember, requires both sacred values and fusion with a particular group. These are independent variables. Each independently can predict willingness to fight. They happen to be practically uncorrelated, but when they interact together, we find they maximize willingness to fight and die and to do other things like torture. Uh, and this is good for uh, militant groups and radical and revolutionary groups, for good or for bad. It's probably also true of people working in the human rights and civil rights movement or in the um, environmental movement who are committed to their cause. The second factor is readiness to forsake family for values. Now that's a very interesting notion. Most of us, uh, most people assume that devotion to your genetic family and for evolutionary reasons is the most important attachment you have uh, in life. But if you look at human history, the creation myths for political systems and religious systems usually focus on willingness to sacrifice your family for some greater cause. Think of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, the greatest cultural hero in history. He's not considered a child molester or a murderer, but he's considered a devoted actor for some great cause. Or the very word Islam, which means submission, and it refers to submission of family and tribe for the greater good, in, in this sense, uh, God's message. And the last one is perceived spiritual strength of in-group versus out-group. Now this is something very interesting. We wanted to see, using evolutionary theory, how people perceive themselves on the front lines in mortal combat and how they perceive their enemies. Now evolutionary theory lends some support to the idea that those who are willing to fight, to puff themselves up and to fight to the death, even if they're small creatures, will usually succeed in warning off the big creature who will then go and see, ah, this guy's puffed up in willingness to fight and die, and he's, that bigger creature is going to go eat a creature that's not as crazy as this one because it's easier, right? So we, we, we developed a measure in which bodies got bigger and bigger and more muscular and muscular, and we asked people, to perceive their own physical strength 
and that of their enemy and to see to what extent their perceptions of their own physical strength and that of their enemy predict costly sacrifices. Oh, I'll go to that. And what we found was that the PKK fighters, who were the only ones who stood the line against ISIS in the initial onslaught in the summer of 2014 and who saved the Yazidis together with their, the YPG in, in Syria, um, and the Islamic State fighters we talked to, threw away the cards, physical strength, both of them, spontaneously, and told us, this is not what's important. What's important to us is their spiritual strength. Ruhi, Akhayri Ruhi, both Arabic and Kurdish. And this was the thing that motivated them. And this was surprising for us. And then we went back to the lab and we developed dynamic measures, which I'll talk about that. And in fact, spiritual strength was the thing that best predicted costly sacrifices. And perceptions of physical strength were unrelated to performance on the battlefield. So let me go through a bit of the data itself. This, was, uh, this is to show that the interaction of sacred values and fusion uh, for the devoted actor predicts expressed willingness to make costly sacrifices, including fighting and dying. So we took two neighborhoods, which we had done, I had done a lot of field work in with my teams. One was Tetuan, especially the neighborhood of the Jama Mizwak. This is where the those who, five of the seven guys who were responsible for the Madrid train bombings in 2004, which was the first terrorist event that actually caused a regime change uh, in a democratically elected country, uh, occurred, and which had sent um, scores of suicide bombers to Iraq uh, during the uh, initial stages of the Iraq war, and were sending, continuing to send many, many volunteers to Iraq uh, uh, to join the Islamic State and Syria. The second was the city Mumin in Casablanca that had been responsible for most of the terrorist attacks in Morocco uh, in the first decade of this century. And so we went into these two neighborhoods. And this just shows uh, how those neighborhoods differ from the towns themselves, each one had involving million posts, uh, in terms of their support for um, the Khalifat's notion of Sharia, strict Sharia, and militant jihad. So these were to radical neighborhoods to begin with. And again, what we found was that the interaction of sacred values and fusion increases, I mean, maximizes willingness to make costly sacrifices. This is from a, uh, proceedings of the National Academy uh, back in 2014. But although we found that fusion and sacred values, this combination, uh, maximizes willingness to fight, we wanted to find out which one, when push comes to shove, may actually be more important. Is it, as the military literature suggests, fusion with a group that is most important, or do values really matter, which the military literature tends to downplay? There are only a couple of studies in which ideology, in a sense, uh, has a role. One is John Dollard's classic study of the Lincoln Brigade uh, during the Spanish Civil War in which he found out that the volunteers uh, were mostly motivated by their values, their belief in an international brotherhood. And others come from sort of anecdotal evidence, but systematically uh, evaluated in terms of the uh, willingness to take casualties among certain units uh, of the Northern and Southern armies in the American Civil War. Uh, those that tended to be uh, highly religiously motivated and highly ideologically motivated were able to take casualties more than those who were not. Uh, in standard military theory, when a group is destroyed to the tune of about 30%, it goes to entropy. And in fact, that's the way the Israelis fought the Six-Day War. They would see if a unit went to about 30% destruction, and without looking further, they would go on to the next unit. Well, we find with devoted actors that the ability to resist uh, casualties is sometimes twofold compared to what's normally expected. And we also found it among certain units of the German army, especially the Waffen-SS, those who grew up together in the Hitler youth and who truly believed in their thoroughly rotten cause, but believed they did. And the German soldiers were by far the best soldiers in World War II, certainly far out fighting taking casualties far in excess of what the Russians, the Americans, and the Brits were able to take. 
So what we did here was develop a measure with frontline combatants where they're forced to choose between their value and who they are. So it actually overlaps. We show these groups overlapping as a devoted actor, and then we show them dynamically separating out, and then we ask them to choose on the iPad, for example, which way they'll go. And it's interesting. Those on the front line overwhelmingly choose their values. And it's a tragic choice. When we ask people, sometimes they break down crying and tell us, for example, Kurdish fighters telling us that they had to abandon their families just a few kilometers away because they knew that the fight for Kadaity, as they called it, for being a Kurd, for their survival of Kurdishness was at stake and they were willing to sacrifice their families for it. And of course, the Islamic State fighters would say the same thing. If our parents opposed it, we'd have them executed. This just goes to show um, to what extent people are willing to sacrifice family and other groups. And here we find that among the fighters on the front line, PKK wasn't involved in this particular battle. It was the Kurdish Peshmerga willing to fight and sacrifice more. And we show that exact all uh, and to sacrifice kin, excuse me. And we also show this in terms of the number of casualties they have, the number of times they're wounded, and the degree of wounded. One of the interesting thing about doing research on the front lines in, a, in combat is that the, the great difficulty in social science between the great gap between willingness, uh, expressions of willingness to do something and actual actions disappear. And of course, for policymakers, it's much more important to know what actually happens than what people say uh, will happen. Uh, this just is how we do these studies. This is an example of the those bodies, those different body size I showed you with the Islamic State fighter. Uh, and the, on the right is the um, dynamic measure we did on the iPad. It's the same measure. Uh, we find that they're completely redundant. That is, there's no difference in the results whether you use one measure uh, or the other. Here is sort of the overall judgment for all fighters on the front line. Uh, we did this for all the participants, including the Russians, the Americans, the French, the PKK, the Iranians. I just thought this one would be interesting for most people in this country. Uh, almost uniformly, all the combatants view the United States as, as in terms of physical strength as maximal and in terms of spiritual strength as middling and view, whoops, and view the Islamic State as weak physically. In fact, that's true. The Belgian army could defeat it tomorrow. It was just a matter of ordinance, but spiritually very strong. And what we find among um, Western youth in France and in Spain, for example, is that they view themselves as spiritually fairly weak. And not only that, the more they view themselves as spiritually weak and their enemy as spiritually strong, naming the Islamic State, the less likely they are, support, they are to support armed intervention and willingness to make sacrifices. And this is the overwhelming majority of youth we test in these countries. We show a spike just after the Paris and Brussels attacks, but within three weeks, this goes down to what it was before. And this, I think, is the most important finding, actually, and I'll tell you why uh, later. Uh, this, for those who are interested in actually what recruitment is like, uh, Al-Qaeda was much more like the National Science Foundation uh, or the NIH. It would accept a bunch of proposals. It would fund 15 to 20 percent of those applied. It never had really any recruiters. Uh, but in any sense, ISIS is much more hands-on. They do have recruiters. It's much more, they're much more important. Um, but you would be surprised that the social media and the role of um, direct recruitment is not entirely the name of the game. In fact, only one out of five who actually join the Islamic State do throw through social media. Not only that, if you look at the recruitment patterns, they're extremely clustered in particular neighborhoods and towns. If it was just a matter of direct recruitment and social media, you'd see a very dispersed recruitment powder. But again, it's highly clustered. It depends basically on who your friends are. The best predictor for who joins the Islamic State is who your friends are and your fellow travelers are in the neighborhoods. You find surprisingly, surprising numbers of whole soccer teams and neighborhoods go to join the Islamic State. So it's the prior social networks uh, that are important the pre-existing groups. Three out of every four who join these groups do it with their friends and fellow travelers. 
Now here's an example of our analysis. This is just a rough, this is just a very cursory um, representation of our analysis of the Paris and Brussels attacks. We've been doing this for a couple of years. We found over 300 people involved in these networks. If you look at the attacks back in 2014, they were very highly dispersed and unsuccessful because they didn't operate on the basis of prior pre-existing social networks. Over time, what happened was people would go to Syria, they'd become devoted actors, in fact, they'd be vetted by the uh, leaders, the emirs of the Islamic State, and then be sent back by the Emni, which is the external operations command of the Islamic State, back into Europe. And there they would recruit their friends and families who had been left behind. And what we find is vast networks, where most of the people don't even know they're involved in the network, but they are from the same neighborhoods and families. And the more that they were relying on these networks, which are not directly involved in criminal activity, but just happened to be friends and families of those who were, the more successful the attacks were. And now what we're finding is that women are the key connectors. They have the highest betweenness factors, the most connectedness in these networks, and they're almost entirely below the criminal radar. So the success or not of these attacks depends mostly <laughs> on women who are not even being tracked by police forces. So as I said, the jihadi movement is a classical, re classical revolution, and it follows fairly well the classical revolutionary tra trajectory. It begins with a set of fairly well-educated and well-off elites. And this has been true since the anarchist movement to today. In fact, we find that all of these uh, insurgent and revolutionary movements um, yeah, led by elites, the plurality of leaders usually have training in the sciences and usually very operational technical training in medicine and engineering. Uh, and the reasons is probably, I mean, this is just speculation on my part, although urban planners for some reason happen to be overrepresented lately, especially in England, is that they have hands-on knowledge of how to actually accomplish things and also can show um, delayed gratification uh, of their goals. I mean, medical school takes a long time, right? And so does, en so does engineering. Um, then it became a mass movement. And although there was an overall reduction in le level of education in SES, many more elements of society have been drawn in. And it varies inordinately uh, across the world. There are 100, 100 nations that contribute to the Islamic State, or did until recently, and they come from every walk of life. There are concentrations in particular uh, socioeconomic groups in different countries. For example, we find overrepresentation in the petty criminal world in France. Why? For two reasons. First, a general reason why we find more petty criminals involved in jihadi activity. Uh, the United States has been very successful in stopping mon large-scale monetary transfers from institutional groups and charities. So these groups have to look for money and logistics where they can find it, and where they can find it is in the petty criminal world. Now, in places like France, 7-8% of the population is Muslim. 60-70% to 70 of the people in jail are young Muslim men. Just like black population in South Chicago, you have an endemic disadvantaged group. And in this society, it's very easy for the Islamic State to recruit. It doesn't work in the United States for reasons I can talk about, but it does work in France. They basically come in and say, look, you don't want to be criminals. And most are, pe pe are petty criminals who do it for opportunity costs, and they really aren't pathological or hardcore criminals in any sense. And the Islamic says that this is what society has forced upon you. Why don't you use the skills that they've forced upon you and turn it against your oppressors? Free yourselves, free your brethren, free the world. And it's an amazingly powerful message when you talk to these people. And we find they're overrepresented, for example, in the ranks of suicide bombers. Those who have education, of course, are less represented for the very simple reason that the Islamic State requires that each educated person with a college degree must pass on their knowledge to at least five people before they're allowed to become a suicide bomber, before they're allowed to become a, a martyr. And it's the same thing for Nusra, well, what was called Nusra, uh, Al-Qaeda. But now it's engaged in state building, and this is very different than what was the case for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State have very different views of, of of, of the way the world is. Uh, bin Laden always opposed the idea of a caliphate because he thought that as long as the United States held hegemony in the world, and that's a changing factor as well today, uh, 
um, it would delegitimize any attempt to build an Islamic State caliphate because it could be defeated militarily. Whereas Zarqawi, who was the father of the Islamic State back in 2006, when it was just restricted to the Levant, felt that we have to destroy the world to save the world, and bringing in the United States and everybody else into this apocalyptic event uh, would force the coming of the caliphate. But now it's engaged in state building, and that requires women. And for the first time, we're seeing massive involvement of women in the jihad. In fact, one out of every three who join the Islamic State from Western Europe, countries like France, are women, because they need them. And women tend to be younger, and yet from high, higher socioeconomic status than the young men uh, who join. In places like England, we find much more representatives in the university than in the criminal population, although we do find as well in the criminal Why the universities? Well, because young men, young Muslims in England come to the universities and they're exposed to what American students are exposed to, binge drinking and free sex. And this bothers a lot of people. And so they're invited to cultural mixers where, they, where, it's, where they're told, why don't you mix with people who think like you, who believe like you, uh, and uh, Slowly, uh, they're vetted uh, for their willingness to blame these uh, excessive behaviors on a crisis, a moral crisis within their host countries, that is the lack of moral principles and metaphysical principles, and some of them, a small minority, are then drawn off to join the Islamic State. Now, people talk about the Islamic State as nihilistic, brainwashed, Cruel. Well, as far as nihilism is concerned, the opposite is the case. They argue that um, the reason they're doing what they're doing, at least those who join it, the foreign volunteers, is because uh, Western societies are nihilistic. They have destroyed all metaphysical and moral principles that mean anything. And interestingly, we find that the women who join the Islamic State tell us almost to a person one of the reasons they join, other than the fact that they can't speak Arabic to their parents who are from for, from Arab countries, and yet they're looked upon by suspicion by their host societies in places like France, is because they want women to be women and men to be men. And you'd be surprised how many people who join these groups, whether on the left or the right, um, believe that to be the case. And they wholly reject a well, multicultural society as destroying the moral norms of society. And this is a very important message, both by the Islamic State and the xenophobic uh, narrow nationalist right, which is working in tandem uh, to sort of undermine the European middle class. Brainwashing is a fiction of the Korean War, when about 100 Brits and Americans decided not to come back uh, to Britain and America. And so a book was written, The Manchurian Candidate, in which these uh, s Chinese social engineering wizards use Pavlovian techniques to wash the brains of these Brits and Americans to kill one another and to kill their political leaders. But that's all basically hogwash. But it's what parents especially invoke when they don't want to take responsibility or can't understand why their kids have gone off to join the Islamic State. Most parents don't know that their kids are doing this thing. In fact, the idea of a clash of civilizations is, I think, uh, entirely wrong. The opposite is the case. There is a crash of territorial cultures where vertical, because of globalization, the creative destruction of globalization, where the vertical links between the older generation and the younger generation, between parents and their children, have been sundered. And peers, young people, are looking up to connect peer-to-peer -peer horizontally across the world. And they're doing so through social media and through other means in a very, very, very narrow bandwidth. And people say it's cruel. Now, it is cruel. Okay? But if you look at the Twitter feeds, for example, of the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, you find about 3% are concerned with punishment. 57%, for example, in the Yemen, in the Marha, are concerned with social development projects for youth. 57%. 18% of the Twitter feeds are, and Instagram and Facebook are concerned with religion, but in a broad sense. Why do we have the markets? Why do we have the courts function this way? Of, again, of which only 3% concerns uh, punishment. Now, in our 
representation of the Islamic State, of course, we turn that completely on its head. Almost all our representation of the Islamic State and its groups is barbarous and cruel, which indeed it is, but that's not all what it's about. It's a very joyous and festive movement, very much like the Nazi movement was at its very beginning. People say, well, providing economic incentives is going to, especially in, for these p petty criminals who, who join for opportunity costs, is going to get rid of the problem or help get rid of the problem. Well, the World Bank has a re report. In fact, they didn't publish it for three years, but now they have an initial publication of it, which shows that there's no relation whatsoever between job production and reduction of violence. And if you think about it, the Islamic State is telling their young people, come here to be sleep deprived, to die, come here for danger and glory, and jobs, offering jobs isn't going to do it. Or they say the, the solution is to be moderate and to take on moderate religion. And now anybody who has teenage children, or probably you at your stage in life, the idea of being moderate is a crazy idea. People want to be powerful in terms of their ideas, glorious. They want to do great things, and that's what the Islamic State uh, appeals to. As a former imam, uh, this is an interesting interview we had uh, on the Syrian border. It was with an imam who was a recruiter for the Islamic State, and left the Islamic State to join Al-Qaeda because he felt that um, the Islamic State was killing foreigners indiscriminately, and it was Islam owed um, respect to their guests, uh, including foreigners. And besides, Zawahiri should be the caliph and not Baghdadi for historical reasons. And his is very interesting because Al-Qaeda was reaching out at the time. They had been excommunicated by the Islamic State. And they were reaching out to people like us, telling us that, look, we were really never interested in attacking the West to attack the West. It was just, you keep out of our hair and we'll keep out of yours, which is baloney. But that was the message they were giving out at the time because they were under great threat from the Islamic State and trying to make alliances of all kinds. And we were making alliances uh, in Syria at the time. But he said the young who came to us were not to be lectured at like witless children. They are, for, most, for the most part, understanding and compassionate, but misguided. We have to give them a better message, but a positive one, to compete. Otherwise, they will be lost to Daesh. This is just a, a general summary of what we found for every terrorist attack um, initiated in the West. It almost, in every, in every case, what we found is there's a countercultural movement, a protest scene, like many of us experienced in the 1960s. But this is the result of the structural dynamics of globalization at the current historical juncture. Well, most people just talk. <coughs> most people don't do anything. They don't plant bombs. I mean, in my day, we had SDS, but very few went on to become weathermen who actually made bombs. And then someone, for some reason, usually because they actually went to fight somewhere in places like Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan, come back. Often occurs in Friday services, uh, if it happens to be a religious community, and say, all you do is talk. Blah, 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 blah. No one's doing anything. We've got to do something. People are dying, so let's act. At that moment, they're usually expelled from the mosque. And that's when uh, usually intelligence authorities in these countries, in Muslim-majority countries, pick up on who these guys are and can usually stop them. For example, in Morocco, you have about 2,500 who's made it to the Islamic State. You have, over, you have 9 to 12,000 who've been stopped by the authorities because they figured out who's likely to go, many of them being expelled from the mosque after these types of, of things. And then they go into a parallel universe. They usually get an apartment together, and they start talking to one another and show each other videos and inviting people to sleep on the mattresses. I mean, when we first did this with the 9-11 bombers in Hamburg, we found that they all went to the same sort of general university. They went to the same two mosques, El-Nur and El-Quds Mosque, and they psyched themselves up. They get an apartment together. The neighbors told us the place stank because nobody went out for months except to take out the garbage occasionally. People would come in, they'd show each other videos, and then they came out of their cocoon wanting to do something, but they didn't know what to do. First they wanted to go to Bosnia, but the Bosnians they contacted said, do you know how to fight? They said, no, so bring us some goggles, night goggles, which were just coming onto the market after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
And then they wanted to go to Chechnya, but actually they were told that the, Ch the Russians aren't allowing anybody into Chechnya at the particular moment. So that was the end of that plan. And then they met somebody on the train. Actually, people think Mohammed Atta was the, was the leader of the group. It wasn't. It was a guy named Ramzi bin al, al Shib, who was a real backslapping uh, guy. But he couldn't get a visa to get back into the United States, so they gave it to Atta, who happened to be the oldest member of the group remaining. Anyway, they got into Afghanistan, not sure exactly what to do. They hooked up with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who said, who, by the way, had just applied for an Al-Qaeda grant and had been accepted in a split vote. He had a previous plot that had failed. And he said, hey boss, look what I got. I got these guys from Europe who want to do something. Great. That's usually the way uh, the plots uh, occur. And of course, publicity, especially in our society, uh, is the oxygen in which all this occurs. I mean, ever since 9-11, the average number of Americans been killed in terrorist attacks has been nine, much less than those killed by lawnmower or falling into the bathtub, falling in their bathtub. But of course, it's not a question of statistics. It's a question of perspective. And for all sorts of political reasons uh, and media reasons, um, this has been blown into an amazing thing, which is responsible, of course, in part for the current political situation <laughs> we were in. <laughs> Another thing. OK, so how do you combat this? Well, the general approach is counter-narratives. This is the idea almost that there's something out there called ideology, which is divorced from the real lives and social networks of people. And that we're going to come up with some counter-ideology, equally divorced from the real lives and networks of people. And this is going to parry uh, the ideology that's brainwashing everybody. Well. I think this is a disastrous approach, and it's led to nothing. I mean, if you look at our, at, at our success against these groups, 9-11 costs between uh, $400,000 and $500,000, and a conservative estimate of the money we've spent in the war on terror by Brown, war costs, Brown University's War Cost Project is between 4 and $5 trillion. That's a 10 million to 1 advantage for the bad guys. And things aren't getting any better. So our strategy isn't working very well. And one of the reasons I think our strategy isn't working well is because we come up with these crazy notions like counter-narratives, which are almost laughable in terms of their impact. Because the things that may move people have to do with mobilizing who they are in the particular real-life networks they happen to be inhabiting. And remember, the, what we found is that recruitment and enlistment into the Islamic State and any of these groups is bound to prior social networks and highly clustered in particular neighborhoods and towns. So you have to engage with the people where they are, and those ideas can be highly different from group to group. So I got a call from the head of the medical school in Sudan telling me that 17 of her brightest students, all A students, have just left to set up a medical clinic in Raqqa. Okay, these were all from fairly wealthy families. And she asked me, why did my students do this? Well, I didn't have the answer, but that was another data point for me to show how diverse the messages of the Islamic State are and how much they engage with the actual networks. They will literally spend thousands of hours on a single person, if necessary, to bring them to the Islamic State. They will say to a young woman in Seattle, we know how hard it is for you to leave your mother and your father, your brothers and your sisters. We know how much you love them. But let us explain to you why honoring your family is not the only or most important thing of life. And then when you come here, you'll understand and you'll explain it to them. And they'll go into it. They'll go into their history. They'll go into um, why in their own society and in the host societies it's necessary for them co to come to fight. So how do you engage? Well, I told you that the way Al-Qaeda and ISIS engages is they actually offer social development projects. They offer involvement in the political program itself. And one of the great successes is that a woman named Elizabeth Kindle, who we also work with in Oxford, she was able to plug in and ride piggyback off Al-Qaeda and ISIS um, successes in the Yemen and offer social development programs for youth, but get the youth themselves to offer their own development, social development programs, including pe cleaning, cleaning up 500 kilometers of beach, uh, which is a remarkable achievement in the Yemen, uh, 
uh, completely done by young people who proposed it themselves. And many other such projects, which cost absolutely nothing because the young people were doing it themselves, and they felt empowered. And it is an interesting thing that they empowered themselves as representatives of their partic particular government, that is, like their particular state, as Marhadis or as Yemenis, in which nationalism played an interesting role. Another example is the Awira girls in, uh, among the Taliban. These are two teenagers who I work with. Uh, uh, we work with the Secretary General now in promoting a UN Council Resolution 2250, which is to bring youth in to have youth themselves propose solutions uh, to violence across the world. Amazing, amazing bunch of young people. Uh, some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life, actually. People who've been shot, who've suffered incredible horrors during war turning themselves to, to making peace. Well, these are two young girls, they were 15 and 16 years old at the time, uh, who set up a group called the Ware Girls in Northwest Pakistan. And their function was to build an advocacy group for women, hard in this most conservative of all regions in Pakistan. Uh, they, were, they were threatened and shot at by Taliban and by Pakistani intelligence agencies, the ISI, from both sides. And yet they persisted. And they brought their awareness to young men who were joining the Taliban. And they brought out first 50 Taliban. And then those young men started talking to other young men. And now they have 1,500 young men working with these young women to bring people away from violence. Now we have examples of these local success stories across the world. Another young woman, for example, at Cambridge now uh, from Pakistan, she uh, developed a theater group which does a sort of passion play of the founder of the, of the Taj Mahal, whose two young sons, whose two sons, one was a scholar, the other was a warrior, um, competed for their father's affections and for the rule of northern India. And although the young scholar was supposed to have won, uh, he was appointed by his father to become his successor, he was eventually killed by his brother, who imprisoned the father himself. And when these stories are played out, and young people are allowed to discuss them, they find themselves ways to resolve those kinds of historical problems in interesting ways and propose novel solutions uh, for today. But here's the problem. There are important success stories all over the world, but they're all local success stories. And that's not enough. One of the things the Islamic State has been able to do is build a worldwide coalition. How can we compete against this? There are no institutional means in existence. Young people are the solution. They are the bulk of today's terrorist recruits and tomorrow's most susceptible populations. The average age of people who join the Islamic State in Al-Qaeda is 26, but it's becoming younger. In Palestine, we find, for example, 14 to 15-year-olds have been joining the Islamic State uh, to counter uh, the Hamas. So how do we bring them together to find their own solutions. Well, again, one of the big problems is that governments view, the view young people as a problem to be clobbered, especially young men, to be smashed. There's very little opportunity given to them uh, at all. So there's no room for expression. There's no room for ideas. All the solutions are being posed by a political class that has allowed this all to emerge that has been extremely unsuccessful in stopping it to any degree, and none of the sort of bottom-up solutions have been able to emerge uh, at all. That's not to say that young people are going to come up right away with a solution to a problem. It's a little bit like Alan Brook, Churchill's chief of staff, saying about his boss, Winnie, he's got 10, good I 10 ideas a day, one of which may be good. The same thing we heard from young people at the World Youth Forum in Amman a couple of years ago. They came up with a gazillion solutions to this kind of thing, some of which were incredible. But the first thing they would say is, governments of the world have to do that, and governments of the world have to do this, and governments of the world have been doing this, and they have to stop doing this, and they must give money for this. And I'm sitting next to the crown prince at the time, and I say, it's dead, isn't it? And he goes, yep, it's dead. He goes, you should have seen what it was like before we got to talk to them at all. Because people in government are also real people. And these young people have to be helped to navigate power, including 
the power of corruption. And there is no guide for them at all. And I think that's the biggest problem we have. I mean, think about youth in the United States after the war. It was the youth boom. It was responsible for the most creative time in the U.S. American history, in American history, in all spheres, and led to radical changes in society for the good in terms of human rights and civil rights. But there is no such thing, there's no talk whatsoever about a youth boom anymore. And there is a youth boom, okay? I mean, half the population of the Middle East is youth, but it's called the youth bulge. And the problem with the youth bulge is you try to shrink it. You don't try to develop it. You don't try to empower it. And here, I think there's a more general problem than this problem, even a deeper problem. For the future of liberal democracies, even beyond the threat from violent extremism, the core existential issue seems to be how comes it that the values of liberal and open democracy increasingly appear to be losing ground to those of narrow nationalisms and radical Islam, which are in a tacit alliance that's sundering the European middle class, the mainstay of open democracy, perhaps the one finding of political science that's entirely robust, in ways similar to the hatchet job on Republican values by the fascists and communists in the 1920s and 1930s. Well, the situation isn't irredeemable, but it's approaching a very dangerous threshold. With mainstream middle classes increasingly alienated from government elites, joining underemployed working class and blaming marginalized immigrant groups for social ills, and radical Islamists earnestly and with increasing success driving the mainstream from Muslims with brutal acts that are meant to heighten sentiments of blame among the mainstream and victimhood among the immigrant Muslims so that back against the wall they lash out with violence. And all this against the backdrop of general demographic decline that increasingly hampers the European countries from sustaining a large middle class, much less armies, 1.6 per couple, without massive immigration to which the European mainstream is increasingly opposed. So there's a deep, deep uh, structural problem. And in fact, if you look at the Bible, the tract, the main tract of the Islamic State is called Idrat wa Tawahush, which means the management of savagery or chaos. The idea is to eliminate the gray zone. The gray zone is the area between true, infidel, true believers and infidels in which most of humanity, including most of Muslims, live. And the way you do that, and that's what they mean by terrorist attacks, is you attack those aspects, well, you go into places like, like Africa where there's chaos and you manage it, you govern it, and you create chaos in the home countries of your enemies. And the way you do that is through political violence, but a particular kind of political violence. The violence has to be perpetrated in the name of Muslims, Islam, in order to increase suspicion among the general population against Muslims. And it's got to be against soft targets, like cafes and theaters. By the way, this was the same way the anarchists acted 100 years ago for many of the same reasons, it's a long story, um, because that will do two things. It will undermine people's faith in the security uh, of their nations, which is the primary function of government, and therefore undermine the governments themselves and cause chaos in the political system, as if we don't know about that. And it will also increase suspicion against Muslims. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite, uh, favorite. It's, uh, I have two articles um, that are my favorite articles that I usually give to my students, or when I did have students, I gave it to them. The first was The Discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick, which is just one and a half pages, and it's a beautiful article in which the end of it simply says, it has not escaped us that this may have implications for the origin of life. I love that, <laughs> that line. The, the second one is a one-page article. Um, it's, a, it's a review of Mein Kampf by George Orwell, one of my favorite thinkers uh, in the world. And in it he asks, how is it that the Western, that the socialist countries, and to a more grudging extent, he says, the capitalist countries, uh, are willing to offer their citizens uh, ease, avoidance of pain, hygiene, health care, in short, the good life. And even the best of us are not willing to 
commit to fight for those values at all. In fact, the Oxford Student Union, the cream of young British intellectuals, had just voted never to fight again for those values. And Mr. Hitler, what is he offering his people? Revolution, danger, glory, death, destruction, and he's got 80 million people who fall down at his feet. Why? asks Orwell. Because Mr. Hitler has understood something profound about human nature. Human beings need, at least intermittently, a sense of transcendence and self-sacrifice. And that's what he's providing, him, providing them. My view, it's an old view. Toynbee had it. Civilizations rise and fall on cultural ideas and not material assets alone. Most societies have sacred values for which their members would passionately fight, even unto the death. This is the case for many who fight for ISIS, especially foreign volunteers, and for some who fight against them, especially for PKK, also happens to be on our terrorist list, and some of the Kurdish fighters we find. But we find no comparable willingness among young Western or many non-Western youth who profess commitment to liberal democracy, as opposed to those who support narrow xenophobic nationalism. More and more, those people are willing to fight, and to fight hard. Now, I ask you, what dreams may come from current government policies that offer little beyond grudging promises of comfort and security? People who are willing to sacrifice everything, including their lives, the totality of their self-interests, will not be lured away by material incentives or disincentives. The science suggests that sacred values are best opposed with other sacred values that inspire devotion, or by sundering the few social networks that embed those values and forging new ones. And above all, a transcendent message and meaning that gives individual existence and significance beyond death, that binds people together beyond perceived self-interest and creates an enduring, preferably peaceful, <laughs> common good. So I, this is just the, so I was at Davos in January presenting some of these ideas. And I was dumbfounded, actually, by the sort of ostrich-style response to the current populist wave sweeping the world. First, we had President Xi, Xi Jinping of China telling us that globalization, as everyone has always held as Davos, is ineluctable, it's inescapable. But there are a few hiccups, and the West hasn't managed it very well. And I'm really the only grown-up left on the block, and you have to leave it to China to manage globalization through double harmony and felicity, is the way they usually talk about it, and to do away with the asymmetries in income and in the distribution of wealth, that is keeping the populist wave alive. Then we had Secretary Kerry, who I admire very much as a, as a person, but I think is way off, both in terms of globalization and terrorism, saying that this is all going to be gone in three years. This is just a hiccup. We had uh, Madame Lagarde from the IMF saying exact thing. And nobody, these are the people who basically rule the world. I mean, leaders and billionaires and no one was coming up with any kind of interesting idea. They were all baffled. They were all stunned by what had happened. No one had predicted it. Well, no one can predict history very well except astrologers in any event. But no one had any idea what was going on. The only novel proposal that I could glean at Davos was the proposal for universal income for poor people. Now, anybody who knows anything about people who join revolutions know that it's not poor people who initiate revolutions. Poor people basically have to find ways to eat and survive, and they don't really have time for political agitation. In fact, we have empirical studies showing this, even psychological studies. But people who do have their basic needs met, who are frustrated in their aspirations, or who have no purpose or significance where they think they should, they become revolutionaries. So actually, the Davos people were proposing something that would probably lead to much heightened insurgency and revolution, especially against those people. And then I was thinking about a much larger parallel, and I guess I'll sort of end with this. And that is between what happened between the Congress of Vienna and 1914 and what's happening now. No, between the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and 1914, World War I, and what's happening in the long relative peace since World War II. And I think it's not just continuity and parallel that I want to talk about. 
its actual uh, uh, parallels, its actual continuity. So what had happened was there was a quasi-anarchic system before the Napoleonic Wars where every state was fighting against basically every other state in a zero-sum game with all their neighbors. And then came the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars with massive bloodletting on a scale that Europe hadn't seen in a long, long time. And so the powers, the conservative governing elites, came together in the Congress of Vienna to establish an informal international order which held pretty much to the eve of World War I. It wasn't a peaceful century. As Hobsbawm said, it was also an age of revolution. But it was revolutions like those of the 1830s and 1848 which were contained. And especially through British pressure and interference, they managed to maintain the empires and nation states as they were just after the Napoleonic Wars all the way up to World War I. But then what happened? Well, the creative destruction of the market economies and the mercantile economies of the time forced the peoples of Europe to make a gamble, which many of them lost. And that gamble was to participate in the Enlightenment project of reason and material success as a means of self-expansion. And as I said, it failed for many who resorted to revolution. And when those revolutions collapsed, it resorted to terrorism, which was the, the basic the reason for the anarchist movement, the basic social revolutionary movement, which caused such havoc in Europe even greater than ISIS and Al-Qaeda killed the Tsar of Russia, the President of France, the Prime Minister of Spain, King of Italy, Queen of Austria, President of the United States. And the reaction to that movement, for example, Teddy Roosevelt's first speech upon taking power after the McKinley assassination, and his subsequent speech on the, what's called the corollary of the Mon Monroe Doctrine, was that this terrorist scourge was the greatest threat to humanity that humanity has perhaps ever faced and necessitated the United States to take the role of an international police force and to interfere everywhere in the world where barbarism was rampant. At that case, including the Philippines, which was undergoing a native insurgency, which then was um, confused and confounded with terrorism uh, itself. The reactions, again, were very much the same. And the only thing that stopped this movement was World War I itself and the rise of the Bolsheviks who killed off the anarchists because they basically co-opted their message in a much better organized fashion that was territorial based, much as ISIS had done to Al-Qaeda uh, up to the present time. But what really undid the world order, of which anarchism was only a symptom, was the inability of the governing elites to provide a sense of meaning and stability to lies that had been forced to give up millennial, age-old traditions for this incredible gamble in this new material world. And so those people and the states themselves began to rapidly throw the rules away. Russia in the Balkans and on its frontiers, Italy in 1911 going into North Africa and eating up part of the uh, Ottoman Empire to create Libya. Germany decided that it had been left out of the world competition and had to go on its own. And the whole system rapidly wound down. And you, nowadays, we talk of globalization. But globalization in those days, from the Congress of Vienna to World War I, greatly surpassed the, 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 the pace of globalization today. For the first time in human history, human beings had been free from muscle power through science and technology. Massive worldwide communications and transportation had emerged for the first time. Telegraph, speed ship, sp uh, steamships, and later the telephone and film. Capital flows, the free flow of capital in 1912 wasn't achieved again until the 1990s. And the only countries in the world that required passports were Russia and Turkey. So there was a relatively free movement of peoples. And it all came to a rapid, sudden, grinding halt. And that, of course, continued through up until World War II, which was just the continuation of the process that occurred. And then there was the sudden victory of the United States. 
who had suffered nothing at all from World War II and was empowered with an incredible amount of wealth and ability to manipulate the world system and create it in its own image. And that has plateaued. But the, the, the important thing, I think, for us to understand is that the processes that led to continuous uh, revolution and eventually the sundering of the world system uh, between, say, 1878 and 1914 are very similar to the processes now extended to the entire world, not just Europe, that occurred then. That is, the dark side of globalization is such that the great majority of people are left out as driftwood. And they have not had the time that the peoples of America and Europe had to adapt to the gamble of material success and expansion. And they're left in the lurch because their age-old traditions have suddenly disappeared and they're on shifting sand. There's nothing at all to hold them. And so, in this world, they reach out to these insurgent and revolutionary movements and populist movements. And frankly, I find it no interesting proposals to change this dynamic. And here's my last slide. <laughs> so, where do we go? This is something I found while photographing, while actually being interviewed uh, about uh, near the World Trade Center. This is right in front of, I mean, the New Liberty Tower. And it's an advertisement that says, commit to something. Guy's just lying on his bed with dollar bills, right? <laughs> or ISIS seems to be the other choice. What in between do we have in our society to hold our values? Because it's the vitality of our values rather than the threat from violent extremists that represent the key existential issue facing us. And this Molly Crockett, the woman who, just, who discovered the relationship between joy and revenge in the brain, just sent me this yesterday and said, you should include that in your slide. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so we have some time long. for some questions, so I'll pass around the microphone for anyone who wants to raise oh. their hand and ask. And I do apologize. I always go on until somebody stops me. <laughs> Sorry for going over the time. Hi. I enjoyed your talk quite a bit. Um, I'm an engineering student, so a lot of the stuff you talked about went right over my head. Um, uh, so a practical question. Um, how were you able to interact with the uh, ISIS fighters and get willing participation from them in the studies that you were doing? I know. Okay. Nusra fighters, I got willing participation. ISIS fighters, I used captured ISIS fighters. Okay. Um, and then you develop techniques. Well, I must say, the foreign fighters are few and far in between because they come to die, and many of them, most of them, and they put suicide belts on them so they're never captured, and the very few that are captured are executed right away. Basically because, for example, if the Kurds capture them, they say, okay, you've come here to kill us, screw you, you're dead. And they blow their brains out after three hours of interrogation, which is the standard operating procedure. But local, local ISIS fighters, or fighters from the immediate region, they will keep alive and actually try, because they want to keep relations open to the tribes from which they come. And this is a way of showing, even though ISIS says we will only exchange corpses, the, the idea of keeping open a dialogue with the tribes in the eventuality that those tribes will, will, will either be liberated from ISIS or fight ISIS uh, allows us to get access to these fighters. Now, people often say, well, captured people um, are likely to lie to you. Uh, they want to get out of their situation. They'll say anything they can. Well, believe me, uh, we've, we've thought about this for decades, and we have techniques to be able to deal with this, including being able to monitor for deception through video. Uh, and now, one of, our, one of the guys who works with us, Doug Stone, he was deputy commander of the forces in Iraq after the Abu Ghraib scandal. His, uh, his role was to uh, get rid of people, uh, no, to um, depopulate the prisons. 
Um, and uh, he's developed all sorts of techniques. He's interviewed thousands of guys and things like voice stress analysis. So we have them with us and things like that. But anyway, we can usually tell when people are lying or not. Okay, and, and, we, and there's a technique we use for, uh, for ISIS that we don't use for the others. We will never ask an ISIS fighter, what do you think about killing, torture, blah. We ask them, after they've already done the fusion task with their close comrades, say, what do your comrades think? And that gives us a good idea of what they think. Because also we don't want to incriminate them uh, in any, if, if, if they're going to have any kind of subsequent appeal on their trial, which many, usually they don't. Yeah, more questions? Hi, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I was hoping if you could expand on something that you just briefly mentioned. Uh, you talked about um, how, and maybe I heard you wrong, but you said that uh, IS fighters might, or they, they want to see uh, Zawa, Zawahiri. Zawahiri. Yeah, they want to see him uh, uh, as their leadership. No, no. This was, uh, I was talking about an uh, imam who is a recruiter for ISIS and who left ISIS to join Al-Qaeda. And he, in leaving mm -hmm. ISIS, said that one of the reasons is he believed Zawahiri, the leader of Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. if anyone deserved to be caliph, he should. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. So it's not, not that they, in fact, they can't stand Zawahiri. They excommunicated Al-Qaeda. So a couple of questions. Sure. So the first one, so about have you tested the counter-narratives argument that it doesn't get much? Is it uh, an issue of source, a source effect? Do, has that been tested with regards to if an imam were to provide this narrative? Oh. As, um, because he's much more, um, I guess, more central to the networks. Right. So consequently, might have more of an effect. And yes. I'll also pitch in my second question, right. which is much early on when you were talking about the fusion, I had a thought, could values be potentially proxying for the idea that it's the self-interest in the afterlife? Uh -huh. Good, both good questions. Okay. So, um, what was the first one? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Source effects. Source effects. Oh, yes. Um, first of all, for local fighters, they know nothing about Islam. So we asked them who Athman was, who Omar, the first caliphs were. They haven't the slightest idea who these guys were, and that's sort of basic um, Islam, not 101, but Islam zero. Um, but there, you know, many of them from poor peasant families who when ISIS came in and they had been shafted by the Shia that the Americans had installed, uh, had no choice. Many of them told us life was hell, their parents had been killed, their families, they couldn't go out of their house for months at a time, so it was a no-brainer for them to join ISIS. Then, in those circumstances, the counter-narratives that work are best seem to be tribal narratives. This is our history, this is our tribe, and ISIS is trying to take over our role. And just as democracy isn't very good at adjudicating over confessional boundaries, um, unless ISIS can appeal to the tribes themselves, it's not very good either. Okay, so it either has to be able to draw upon those tribal passions and histories, or it fails. And one of the best ways of opposing them is doing that. Now, as far as those people who actually understand something about the history of Islam, ISIS is very careful about um, how they frame and how they bring people in. So in February 2014, they floated the notion of the caliphate. Okay, and then for six months, there was an intense discussion. Uh, in Islamic circles, on the internet, in social media, about the meaning of the caliphate, its history, blah, blah, blah. And then in June 2014, they established the caliphate after vetting it. Um, it wasn't something that just came like Athena from the head of Zeus spontaneously without no reflection of the other. And while they're doing this, they're elaborating again a fairly, a fairly deep um, interpretation of Islam, of the Salaf, so for example, one of the things you hear from people who don't know anything about the Islamic State, or very little, 
is the traditional uh, idea that jihad is really the inner struggle for spiritual enlightenment rather than this violent struggle um, for the expansion of Islam. Well, this is a Sufi uh, invention of the Abbasid Caliphate. And in the early days of the Caliphate, there was no such thing as this in spiritual enlightenment as part of Islam itself, even though you can use the Hadith and the Quran to justify it, as Sufi scholars uh, did. So the way you can succeed is to try to show that their interpretation, among those who are knowledgeable, is that their interpretation may be erroneous. And that works. The Saudis have tried it with very, very limited success after pouring uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars in it. They have very little success. And, and few people who, have real, who don't have real deep knowledge of how they're actually thinking uh, could hope to succeed against them on that level. So yeah, you could use narratives, but they have to be pretty well-informed narratives. And certainly nothing like we had, we used to have the head of the IMH, who happened to be a man of American, holding up a piece of pita bread and say, we have the best pita here as well, and anybody can do it, and Muslims in America, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's laughable and cringeworthy, right? But that's basically what our public diplomacy was. So it has to be much better than that. And the second question, boy, am I getting see my... The afterlife. The afterlife, yeah. You know, um, rational choice models, um, can always come up with ad hoc hypotheses about why preferences um, are not to us rational, but to the people we're trying to describe as rational. And one of the popular ones you see in public choice or in the political science journals is belief in the afterlife is a rational preference for these irrational people. And therefore, what they're doing is perfectly rational. Well, of course, you can always come up with ad hoc hypotheses. Um, I haven't found among any group um, a, the criteria of looking for virgins in heaven as a motivation, as a systematic motivation for something like suicide bombing. In fact, all of the organizations I've talked to said if they came looking for sex in the afterlife, they'd slam the door in their faces. Now, that doesn't mean that some won't. For example, Alaska, Alaska Martyrs Brigades, because Hamas had been so successful in their um, use of suicide bombing in um, increasing market share. I'll use the language that uh, you, know, you guys like. <laughs> increasing market share, uh, the Fatah, al aqsa Brigades, and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine also decided to use suicide bombers. And they would actually convince a few people, especially nine-year-olds, that they could get sex in heaven. And that may have been, uh, that may have been played a role idiosyncratically, but certainly not for Hamas. Certainly not for Hamas. I mean, well, the Hamas people at the time, they were telling us we would only pick the best of our br and brightest. And there you can use uh, a version of evolutionary theory, and they were explicitly telling us for costly signaling purposes. Because if you show, if we show that we're willing to sacrifice our best and brightest to this cause, then that cause is truly worthwhile. And it shows we are sincere. And that's a more general this, it's a more general lesson about religion, I think, and about something I call meaning and purpose in life. Social contracts are an inherent disadvantage to religious and transcendental ideas for this very simple reason. Social contracts are matters of convenience, and that means there can be a better bargain down the line. And if there's a better bargain down the line, then by backwards induction, any time you suspect the better, there's a better bargain down the line, it's much better to defect now. But if you live with, in a religious system which is blind, or a transcendental system which is blind to exit strategies, as Bob would say, you have a long, potentially infinite, indefinite shadow of the future, and a guarantee that the contract will endure. And here's another paradox about human beings. Human beings make their greatest exertions for ill or good for absurd ideas. Take religious ideas. They are inherently absurd. They're non-propositional. Take God as three in one. What the hell does that mean? Or God is omniscient, impotent, omni <laughs> impotent. And, <laughs> so please excuse the slip. God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Now, what does it mean? As, as Hobbes himself said, and Galileo, it's incomprehensible. That's the mystery of God. In fact, we, we do experiments where we say, okay, Johnny, he's in Wisconsin. His foot is caught under a rock. The water's rising. 
he prays to God to save him. At the very same moment in Australia, Mary, she falls on the railroad tracks. She can't get up. The train is coming. She prays to God to save her. What does God do? Now, we do this with priests and rabbis and imams and sadhus. And no one says, wham, bang, thank you, ma'am. God does it, and that's the end of it. They ask, how fast is the train coming? Does Mary have any brothers and sisters? Things like that. To make it comprehensible, because it is literally comprehensible. Now, why can these kinds of ideas inspire such powerful devotion and action? And look at ritual. Ritual is even crazier. All sorts of crazy things and tappings and things like that. But they provoke the greatest and costliest sacrifices among human beings. In fact, the, the absurdity is almost proportioned to the willingness of people to sacrifice. Now, that's an enormous paradox in terms of human behavior. Why is it that apparently absurd ideas are able to provoke such sacrifice, such cooperation, and such seemingly intractable conflict? That's who we are. So we're just a little over time, but we're going to have one more question. Hi. So uh, you talked about that these communities that, are, uh, that engage with I ISIS, they operate in small communities, and they are like part of some neighborhoods or like mosques that are like in, lo in localities. And they mostly communicate through social media that's very identifiable, such as Facebook and Twitter. So how, wh what strategies do you recommend to identify them firstly? What, and what's your uh, stake on privacy? Uh, and also, even if like we do identify these uh, these people, how do you want to like handle them? As in like, how do you target them or right. um, just subside them or? Uh, okay, so the path to radicaliza like to the radicalization, uh, revolutionary ra is a path, and those people who lock into devoted actors. To tell you the truth, I don't think there's much you can do except sundering the networks and doing something once it's destroyed then you do something like denazification, which only worked intermittently. But the problem with ISIS, of course, is even though they have territory, it's a very dispersed infrastructure. So it's gonna be very difficult. The question is, the people before they get there, before they lock in and become devoted actors, what do you do with them? Well, there, at very early stages, material incentives uh, can help, but mostly it's young people turning other young people away through things that mean something in their particular neighborhoods and networks. And I can't a priori tell you what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, let me just give you an anecdote. So I'm asked to evaluate for USAID, Agency for International Development, uh, something called Local Governance Project in Morocco, where they've invested tens of millions of dollars in helping young people get into local governments. Of course, I'd estimate well over 90% went into corrupt officials who I knew who bought furniture from the Queen and their apartments at 10 times the value anyway. There were a few um, good programs. But anyway, I asked the, the AID people, so what, what criteria of evaluation should I use? And they say, well, things that we can quantify, number of uh, Dar al-Shabaab, uh, Maison de Jeunesse, youth houses that are built, um, how many people are coming into them, how much money was spent, blah, 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 blah. I said, don't you want to know what they're thinking, what they're doing? I mean, that's the whole purpose of it. I said, well, that we can't quantify. By the way, this is what I get from Congress all the time. And so does people like Panetta, who tried to bring the same stuff up to Congress, and he gets the same answer. Well, how do you quantify this? And what I found was, when I went into these youth houses, they're surfing on computers that paid by the American tax paper, pay pornography sites, jihadi sites, everything in the world. And they've come up with their own language, which they call Franglish, which is a mixture of French and English and Spanish and Arabic. And many of them are just semi-literate, but they've, managed, they've mastered this language and they're communicating with one another and they're talking about everything in the world you can think of, their futures, their hopes, their dreams, what's available, jobs, women, jihad, everything you can think of. And I'm going, this is the best thing I've seen. This is the most successful um, action by USAID I've ever seen and our best chance. Because here we have inadvertently helped create a medium for these young people to express themselves freely and they're coming up with ideas 
Maybe we can follow them. Maybe we can even enter them and see which works and which not, moving them away from jihad. And the answer was, we've got to kill it right away. I said, what are you kidding? I said, this is, a, this is, a, this is serendipity. And they said, no, no. Can you think of the New York Times or the New York Post coming out with something, a headline, UX taxpayer um, promotes pornography and jihadi surfing in Morocco, for example. And so it was dead. If you look at the bureaucratic structure of the United States, you'll also find that the United States Security Council, National Security Council, at least up to the present administration, is responsible for all of U.S. foreign policy. The State Department and the Defense Department are merely ex executors. And if you sit in on the NSC, you will see that there's no representative from any human health, education, welfare, thought, conception, anything. There's the kinetic agencies and there's the Council of Economic Advisors and they're all rational choice people, right? And all believe that the Enlightenment, their particular inversion of the Enlightenment is how the world works and that they can manage this. And so there's very little attempt, and this is different from domestic policy, of course, where things like that matter, there's very little attempt to actually understand what people are thinking and what can move them away. And so you bring in experts, you think are experts, especially those who cater to your particular interpretation of the world, and who tell you that this narrative is going to work, or this narrative is going to work, or moderate is going to work, or this interpretation of Islam is working. And that's basically where we're at. I don't see any, any really concerted effort, except one. It's called Peer to Peer. It was started by a guy named George Selim at Homeland Security, uh, and then taken over by Facebook, which now funds it entirely, which has representa representation in about 70 countries, uh, in which young people themselves come up with projects to move other young people away. And it's amazingly innovative. I mean, I've seen the theater productions they've done, the sports they've done, the historical projects, they've, the, the social development project, but no one's evaluated it yet. So I'm holding my, but it's the most promising thing I've seen. So I guess a long, uh, the, the short of the message is, let the young people come up with something themselves. Give them a platform. And uh, let's see what the real world constraints on achieving those dreams and aspirations are. And I, again, I don't see anything like that. I mean, I was talking to, what's his name? Let's see, what's, what's the former senator from Connecticut? Come on. Lieberman. Lieberman. I was talking to Lieberman a little while.